Okay, welcome everyone to another Coaching Corner. Today we are going to talk about people of color being uh, workers in the during the Black Lives Matter movement and how they're affected through that. We're also going to talk about Pride, specifically Black Pride, because um, this is the month of June. We have guest speakers today, success coach Sophia Faustin, uh, Graciano Matos, and we have Hostos alum, Christopher Stalling, who's gonna lead our conversation. Um, so Graciano, Sophia, do you wanna start us off? Um, sure. Hello everybody, welcome to Coaching Corners. My name is Graciano Matos. Um, so in today's, um, today's event, we're going to talk about some of the um, things that have been happening. Well, you know, we want to open up for discussion about some of the things that have been happening in terms of people of color going back to work, whether the employers have been supportive um, of the Black Lives Matter. So we have different examples that I'll just bring up and then people can chime in. So for example, you have some businesses that have um, come out and been uh, not, not so supportive and actually punitive. So you have Wawa, which is like a gas station, kind of 7-Eleven type of business that operates a lot in the Midwest and the Western states. And Publix, which is a supermarket chain that operates in Florida, there's a lot of them in Florida and different places. And both of them, you know, told their employees um, or were punitive in terms of them wearing, just not even protesting or anything, just like wearing something that said BLM, Black Lives Matters on, uh, on them, attire. Starbucks originally also had something similar where they told them that and then they quickly reversed it. Um, and that was a little bit more, I guess that that is a little bit more debatable because they do have a history of coming out in solidarity with different courses in the past. So I think a lot of people were actually surprised more at Starbucks specifically. Um, and then you had other examples of businesses doing the opposite. They're very supportive. Um, Apple, Nike, Lowe's, which I just found out a few days ago is uh, partially black owned or operated by an African-American CEO. Um, and then the other story, well, let's talk about these two first, because I think we could go off um, and then we'll, we'll bring up the other examples. So I don't know, does anybody want to say anything or have questions or comments about that? So you can chime in everyone or you can use the raise your hand feature um, if you have anything to contribute. Well, I know there was some speculation um, that people had initially when Starbucks did not supply their employees with shirts having to uh, do with supporting the movement um, or even just employees coming in using face masks um, that may have said Black Lives Matter or I can't breathe. Uh, and Graciano did mention that they kind of changed their tune a little bit saying, well, this isn't part of the uniform, so you can't wear a Black Lives Matter shirt or anything along those lines. Um, but on the flip side, you know, Starbucks provides their employees with pride shirts. Uh, and some people felt had different feelings um, about it. And um, now they're, they put out statements saying that they are supporting the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but, you know, they did have to kind of get a little cocotazo, if you would, um, before something like that came out. Does anyone have any thoughts or feelings surrounding that? Uniforms, um, for example, right? So Starbucks supplies uniforms to their employees, right? You have to have one of our shirts or wear this polo or whatever the case may be. And um, this is something different that uh, is going on. Hello? 
Karina? Oh, Not my guess. Hey, Karina. Hey. My guess is that um, sometimes brands want to protect their own brand. And so if the customers are not part of the Black Lives um, movement, they might feel offended. I know that a lot of people misinterpret what Black Lives Matter means. And so understanding that all lives cannot matter unless Black Lives Matter. Right now, they're the ones right now that are being treated unfairly. And so we need to support our Black brothers and sisters in our community and not just see it from one perspective. And the same could apply for the Blue Lives Matter, especially that in my household, my husband's a sergeant and he is a blue life. However, when he removes that blue uniform, he is brown. So he is pro Black Lives Matter because the uniform is temporary. It's not a life, it's, it's, it's a job he's gonna retire in a few years. And so I feel that these brands, these companies were more worried about marketing and branding to protect their image versus their, their own staff. And sometimes we need to question are we about our staff? Are we about the customer? How do you balance it? And so, you know, it's it's tough. The, the, you, somebody, somebody was gonna say, do you guys feel that it depends on like how the company, the, the, the individual company markets itself um, in the past, like their past behavior, like so do we hold um starbucks or yeah like starbucks to a different standard than like Publix, for example which i mean i'm not i i only see Publix when i visit florida so i i don't know much about their corporate statements but does it depend on the actual company and what their history is um i don't think so i think um I am not as moved by gestures of support of Black Lives Matter by corporations when they're led by billionaires who are out of touch. And um, remember last year, there were two men who got um, arrested in a Starbucks and this, mm -hmm. um, this, the Starbucks did this whole thing, right? So Publix, like Publix and um, a couple of other brands are actually uh, really big in the South, like the Florida. So like I went to, went to Morehouse in Atlanta mm -hmm. before going to Hostos and Publix is all over, over, over Georgia, all over the South. Um, so, I'm more attached to even with Pride, right? Um, being Pride Month, people only talk about gay stuff or black stuff, doing black history or doing Pride Month. So the I, I know that it's important for visibility sake for people to be in solidarity, but I also want people to uh, uh, require more than just uh, allowing people to wear shirts. Because like typically Starbucks have the uniform of Starbucks is actually a hat and a um and an apron. You can actually wear anything black, right? So anything black, be it from the Gap. Old Navy, as long as it's a black t-shirt, black pants, they don't actually care what you wear. So yeah. for them to make us think about Black Lives Matter, it actually shows where, they, where their politics lies. Mm -hmm. And according to your question around history, history is important in context to what people were doing. But again, like capitalism and this big thing around um, who gets support and when and why, people have feelings behind it. But then the day you get to think about where does the money go? Exactly. What communities do they serve? Um, they all have philanthropic um, arms of their corporations. Where does that money go, right? So Publix has stuff they do with schools and neighborhood communities and things, which again, again is cute. But if people are requiring something around people who are really identifying as black, what does that look like? But just making a statement, allowing a t-shirt to me isn't enough. It's just um, kind of appeasing people's feelings. Like, y'all upset? Yo, go wear a shirt, have a good time. Um, and again, certain, just like churches, like some, certain places, certain chapters of certain uh, uh, Locations do what they want anyway, right? They don't care about what the corporation says. They, they'll put a Black Lives Matter sign in front of the door. They don't care. So it just, I think people need the top to do a thing. And I think I'm more attached to people at the bottom doing a, a different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if y'all mind if I jump in, Allison. But Christopher, this is it, by the way, guys. But Christopher, I mean, like, you definitely were getting at what I was, you know, I was about to kind of jump in on loot to. But with this whole, with everything going on, in a lot of ways, I feel like companies kind of had no choice but to show support, right? And that's what makes me question it because Black Lives Matter ain't new. Like, this has been around, like, years this has been happening, right? It only took that the nation was about to go in, right? On, and whether it was writing, whether it was protesting, whether it's whatever, us starting to see the value of our dollars and where it goes that I think companies almost had no choice for their business, their bottom line, right? They had to, it had to be like, nah, we with y'all because we ain't trying to lose your business kind of thing. And to your point, Christopher, I don't care that y'all said you support Black Lives Matters. What are you actually doing? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Because 
like all how much money those corporations own, right? When the bail, when when the last stimulus um package was was approved, we got twelve hundred dollars max. Y'all know what corporations were getting? Millions, mm-hmm. millions, Tr- trillions, trillions. That's a fact. You know what I mean? Like, trillions of dollars. So it's kind of like you know I'm not really buying the whole everybody throwing up. The NFL, that was the one that, for me, really said it all, right? Like, they really saw what was up. Like, between the players, between the people, they knew they was about to have no fan base right now. They ain't having nobody sitting in those stadiums because of COVID. And now for people watching, they kept up with this. Come on, I know people, we've all seen that image of Kaepernick, you know, next to the image of George Floyd, at, you know, at that unfortunate time. But, you know, I'm right there with you, Christopher. Like, I kind of feel like the, the statements don't mean much to me. Like, I want to see what, what are y'all really about to do after this? Right? And it's really on us, right? So more than just... um waiting and seeing but also challenging right so who's uh, who's the top part of your administration your leadership right and that goes for host those too goes to, for community goes for any institution right who is deciding things for people who don't look like them and why and if my name was hakeem or hassan or jamal or shakniqua would i get the same kind of conversation um when i'm getting interviewed for a meeting when i do i get are women being elevated are trans people being elevated um are being hired right so the solidarity is important, right? Like the country wouldn't be where it is without Emmett Till's death and his mother putting him in the newspaper. Like there are things that are symbolic that have to happen, but they killed Marsha B. Johnson, right? Like the, the, the Pride Month is uh, celebrating Pride and it started with a riot, quote unquote, for seven days. And a black woman, a black trans woman led that thing and they, and they killed her and left, left in the ocean. Her, her, her case to this day is not, not solved, right? And they want to give her a park in Brooklyn to honor her, but also the same city who killed her who didn't care about her life and she was homeless and living under the pier. So like, it just, um, I just want all of us to require more and have a full conversation about all the things that are possible because sometimes uh, capitalism and media allows us to be emotional and go, yes, mm-hmm. Rihanna Taylor, like, yes. But like George Floyd isn't the first person. Well, it's the only person that died that week, right, that month. Um, and you have to always be mindful of, like, because people call, even call it a riot, right? It's not a riot, it's an uprising. It's a rebellion, right? So even the language around how we talk about these things, even though we're trying to get language and talk through it, has to honor what it actually is. Um, and there are people dying in the street every day, right? Um, so if you're working in a corporation, require them to do more, right? Mm-hmm. Show with your full self. And when somebody's trying to get hired, whose name is crazy or whatever, it's like give them a little bit of time because that's that's part of the system, right? The system of white supremacy, the system of oppression, even saying POC and not saying black, like that, like these things support a bigger narrative of quote unquote inclusion, but also it misses the, the point, right? Like we live in a country that was built by enslaved people, period. Every school you want to go to, everything you want to do is built by somebody who was black who died. Period. The right to vote came from somebody black. Period. Like it just that's what it is. So it's not about making people feel less than for not being part of the conversation. It's like no, these are radical truths that exist that are period. So when you talk about institution or corporation like the NFL, mm-hmm. nobody is black who's running those meetings, the conversations. Nobody is. So where um what are some of the things that um whether it's a corporation or institution, a, a city, a town, congressperson, where is where does it go from just simple, nice little words on a paper to actual things that impact people's lives? Like where, what are the things that people should be demanding or asking or, or expecting from these different um, organizations? Well, my grandmother always says, take care of your house first. So there are macro and micro things that, that can exist. So micro is kind of like um, how I talk about a thing is what I can control, right? So everybody who comes to my, comes into my uh, ether who talks to me about a black life, regardless of where they are, um, I engage them with a different level of kindness and grace and with language, right? Also self-education, right? The things that we got in school, specifically in CUNY, don't really give us an understanding of what it is. So like, what people who go to a hostess could do is take a class. So um, Christopher, Dr. Christopher Burrell does American history from um, Revolutionary War to Reconstruction, and Reconstruction to, um, to present day. He, he doesn't do black history or people of color history separately. He involves it in, in, in ways into 
um, I'm agree with you. So I'm saying we can't we can't be a we and get a thing from somebody bigger if we don't first arm ourselves with information. You know, so yeah. understand who raised us and why. Period. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a, a macro and a micro. I think people want to fight the corporation or the big man upstairs, but their houses are not in order. In yeah. CUNY, Hostos, people's homes, how they love, how they deal with their hair. These are all the things you can actually deal with, right? Self-love and loving all his pictures. And like these, these are small, nuanced things that we can do today. And mm -hmm. once we get that love going together, whatever, then we can get together and go, cool, what do we need? More than just them giving a million dollars to Black Lives Matter, where's that money going to go, right? Mm -hmm. In the beginning of COVID, they had um, GoFundMes and people giving money to people who, are, who needed it across the board, right? Uh, people who are Black at the front line because we all have city jobs, right? The nurses, the doctors, I mean, the teacher, the sanitation workers, MCA workers, so like, these people need a job, which is why they're working every time, because they want to, right? Because um, it implies that, like, oh, because you're Black, you are in front. Like, yes, and why? If you can only get certain kind of jobs, then that's why we are doing it. Why people in the Bronx are all outside them because they're like, what am I supposed to do? I still got to eat, right? So it just, I just think people want to feel empowered, but I think that feeling is um, misplaced if we don't take care of ourselves first. Um, and ourselves could be, could be our school, our friends, our, host, our houses. Like, these are the things that we, ha we have to do in a, a very, very different way. So when we say Black life matters, it matters more than just as a systematic thing. It has to matter in how we date, <laughs> how we talk about, talk to each other, how we deal with colorism, right? And, and other POCs have a similar history with imperialism, with colonization, with oppression and colorism, but they, it's also about not wanting to be Black. <laughs> so if you don't first deal with that truth about what it is, you gotta, can't expect CUNY to do a thing for you because they like, we feel the way you feel. I'm gonna give you this little thing and you're gonna shut the hell up and leave me alone. Like. That's an excellent point. Um, a lot of excellent points. Thank you, Chris. Uh, how are we taking care of ourselves? What language are we using? You brought up colorism. That will be a topic at Coaching Corner on July 8th. Little future uh, plug there. But it's so right. How do we feel within our own homes? How are we dealing? And being a part of CUNY, CUNY responded with um, recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday. We had the, the day off, but is it, yeah, one of those things where it's like, here you go. Um, what else? Here you go and nobody knows what, it, what a Juneteenth is still. People are talking about how Lincoln freed the slaves. He did not. No. Like, they keep talking like, yeah, I was going to call about Juneteenth. I was like, what the, do you know what Juneteenth is? Do y'all know what that actually is and what it means and why we do it in the first place? Yes, we talked about that. On Friday, yeah. Derek led our history lesson on that, and we were very yeah. Um, But right, so what what are what are people doing? How do you make sure your house is clean? How do you make sure that's being taken care of? Um, I loved your point about the use of words, not a riot and uprising. I think that's so good. It's you know we speak things into existence. I believe um, so. It's about using the appropriate language. Um, and being very conscious of the words that we're using um, because they are very, very powerful. I wanted to, um, we had some comments about, yeah, the corporations and the billionaires, one from and Coach Jasmine that, you know, it's, it's not moving. It, uh, the black dollar is powerful, so of course they feel impelled to issue a statement when they actually really don't care. You know, I think social media is really pushing for companies to say something, so it does not feel genuine. Um, definitely feels uh, disingenuous. It does not feel like they would have done it otherwise. I think they would have continued to send those employees home who decided to wear um, attire supporting Black Lives Matter, and that would have been it. Um, so can I just jump in a little bit about genuine corporations? Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Erin Condren, um, a company that makes planners. Planners, you know, we can get them for $5 at Staples, you can get them for $15, or you can pay $50 for a planner made in America, all of this other good stuff, um, and really get it customized. So Erin um, Condren, she, a mother of 
four or something like that, her twins, um, she, they graduated from high school. So they're part of this 2020 class. And in learning that they are not going to be able to have a graduation ceremony or a party or anything like that, um, the parents in this graduation committee really worked hard to try to figure out, well, how can we have some kind of celebration? So they tried to do something on the beach with hula hoops. So everyone was socially distanced from each other and they tried something else. And someone on the committee, I guess, uh, had been to a Black Lives Matter march recently. So someone in the committee decided, well, why don't we petition this as a Black Lives Matter march in the students an hour after receiving their diplomas um, in smaller groups from their high school, went on this march together and still in their graduation garb under guise of Black Lives Matter um, and got to spend time, some without masks, absolutely no social distancing. Um, they did that. And this is, you know, just a white community that went along and did this and no one got penalized or no one was arrested um but they were you know asked to go home after a certain period of time it was just you know a total example of their privilege um and just thinking like if something like that happened here in the bronx uh, we already know that people would be there would have been riot here tear gas all kinds of ridiculous things to break it up um and you know everyone a lot of the uh consumers from Erin Condren kind of called her out on it and she put out a statement uh, shortly after about Black Lives Matter but um, one of the things I've seen in the comments is that no one's there for that for this and it's just really tough to even want to continue to support um, when you know that someone wasn't aware of their privilege um, and used it in a way that is totally telling of the times um, it's not something that anyone else in any other uh, class in any other, uh, I'll, I'll say color, if you would, would be able to uh, get away with. So there's a matter, one of the things I saw that was really telling to me was, um, and I had to actually discuss it with Chris yesterday, um, you know, some of us have different privileges and we are, may or may not be aware of them, but acknowledging your privilege is one thing, but finding a way to take care of your house and acknowledge it and do things to be better about it. Um, that's definitely where we have to, you know, move forward and, and work on. Um, but then on the flip side, we have to allow, hope that other people um, are good enough friends to us, like Chris is to me, to, give us space to acknowledge that and help us work through it. Go ahead. I also don't want us to get caught up on just acknowledging. I think uh, Sophia made two points. Uh, acknowledging and action are should happen together, but aren't the same thing. And it's similar around, around the Emancipation Proclamation. It was an announcement. That's all it was, right? So what people are saying is that Black Lives Matters is the minimum thing that we matter, right? It also should be valued and honored and elevated so I'm just saying that sometimes uh, it's hard because we're fighting to just be acknowledged, right? The, uh, the things that black people in the country have done for 400 years to help advocacy for things to exist, they want it to be acknowledged, but also there's so much more that has to happen, right? Uh, and be careful around when, you have when we have conversations around anything about just wanting people to acknowledge how you feel. This is important, right? Validating people's emotions and experiences are very important. But which is the problem with diversity and inclusion, you just stop there, right? We know people who are trans exist, so we acknowledge their presence, right? Yes, you exist. Nobody's asking them what the cost is, right? So during Pride Month, a lot of there's a lot of money that's put into the gay community during Pride Month. So the uh, the ballroom scene, um, HIV advocate, like there's so much money being pushed into the community. So during COVID, none of those events are happening. So people aren't getting paid. People aren't getting paid. So the most at-risk people in the, in the community are not, not only being murdered, but also can't eat and can't pay their rent or can't do anything. So yes, acknowledging their presence is important, but also understanding how that's only literally like step one <laughs> out of 10 
um, and that can go for any community. Um, I took a psychology and black experience class at, 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 at City College, and uh, the teacher was a black woman. We spent so much time talking to people who were non-black in the room, who were also of color, around the, why this conversation was important. And so I was like, well, why are you here if you didn't want to learn about um, crack epidemic and the drug war and enslavement and suffering? Like, why did you want not want to know that, right? Um, and it's a, a thing people are taught around just acknowledging truths, but then do what? What are you going to do with the thing you learn, right? And it's like, it, are we teaching students to be critical thinkers to like and take what you learn in the classroom and put into action, right? Not only in your house, but hopefully outside, right? So I'm also a student ambassador in the Leadership Academy, so we did a lot of community service, but those, this is always telling us how you should be um, always engaged with the work. Like, oh, well, I learned this idea in class. How am I going to use it? Like, what am I going to do with it? How am I going to spend it? So acknowledgement is can, should never be the, should never be enough or the goal in any conversation with a partner with a corporation, with an institution, you should want more of this to be seen. And sadly, people only stopping there. Thank you. So, I'm actually gonna, uh, Derek had his hand raised, so I'm gonna let him, let him chat. Sure. Um, a lot of amazing, amazing points. Um, something Chris and Sophia definitely touched on. I have more of a question than a, uh, a response. Um, so when we're talking about all these different corporations, one, I agree 100%. Um, okay, you're a big corporation, you're a millionaire, you're gonna say Black Lives Matter. That's nice, but that's like, you know, that's it. Like that, that means very, very little to me. Um, it's better than saying nothing, I guess, um, but whatever. Um, but something I guess I'm personally struggling with right now are the places that are going out of their way to basically say the opposite. Um, the places that are kind of maybe doing the all lives matter, um, the, the places that are kind of trying to minimize what's going out on out there. Um, but these may be um, businesses or corporations or people that I've had to, I continue to work with. And it's like, it's a real, real hard, you know, if this is a place like, um, I'll just throw it out there, Home Depot I know has a tricky kind of uh, history there, um, but truthfully, and Lowe's is, is for this issue is a much better place, but there is not a Lowe's anywhere near me. Lowe's is like a two hour drive for me, whereas Home Depot, they're like three down the block. Um, so, and I'm, for those of you who don't know, I'm in the process of moving, so I'm always trying to get a supply. So it's like, I kind of need to get stuff, but it's like a struggle um, making that decision. And I just use them as one example. There are like actually a lot of other examples um, some big, some small. So I just want to throw that out there, get other people's thoughts on that, how people are kind of dealing with, you have your everyday life and your everyday things that you're going through. You have this, you know, really important um, moment in time and things that are being brought up, um, issues, and now they're kind of really right against each other. How do you, how do you make that decision or what's people's thought process on that? So I just want to throw that out there if anybody wants to chime in. Um, Allison, I don't think I keep going and start. No, 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 I was saying, yeah, please chime in. Let me mute myself. You're good. No, Derek, I mean, honestly, man, that's something I struggle with myself. Like, it's so hard to, like, to really, like, you know, you want to take your dollars and put it places that you know. And I think we got to do what we can with the places we know is going somewhere good. But it is challenging. Like, and, you know, I remember this actually, I remember having this conversation a few years ago when it came to the NFL stuff, right? Because at one time, at one point, a lot of people were starting to protest the NFL. And you know, I think that was a, a great like example of just compromising, right? We all saw what was going on. We saw what was good. And it was one of those things, like, the way I kind of looked at it, though, like, you know, I remember I, I had brought it up was, like, in some of the conversations I had was, like, if I'm going to protest the NFL, there's so many other companies I need to protest right now. You know what I mean? To be consistent across the board. Like, and to your point, like, how can you even manage it when we don't even have a choice sometimes in some of the places we have to go? I don't think I'm answering your question at all. I'm just letting you know I'm right there with you. And it's hard, man. I don't know. I don't know. How, I, it's just... Definitely, I will say on social media, I've been seeing a lot more information on Black-owned businesses. And that's helpful. Mm. It directs us in one place. But, you know, I haven't seen the Black-owned Home Depot yet. So I don't know. Maybe it is one of those, like, maybe something like that that we can invest our money. But, you know, yeah, I mean, it, we'll see what, what other people have to share. But please, help us. No, I, yeah, thank, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And thank, one, it's good to hear it's not just me, because there are times I'm like, maybe it's just me. I'm the only one struggling with this. Um, but I would say definitely a good point is to, whenever possible, look for those other businesses. Um, some, like, 
Um, I know it's an issue like just across the board with um, economics and based off of your, where you live, you are sometimes limited to what you can buy just across the board. I know my um, sister, um, my uh, stepsister, she lives in a, a food desert. So she, there's only one supermarket nearby. Like if that's owned by, you know, the clan, she's out of luck. She still has to shop there because that's the only place she can go to shop. Um, so you kind of have to do what you have to do. Um, but yeah, I, I, at least it's good to hear I'm not the only one struggling with that. Uh, I'm going to call on Carrie Ann Floor and then Sophia with the hand raised. So I'm going to unmute you, Carrie Ann. I thought I did. Um, can you hear me? Okay. But I can't hear you guys. Okay, as long as you can hear me. Um, I wanted to just piggyback, uh, piggyback off of what um, Derek said. In my own neighborhood, and again, I guess this, is, this will go back to the, um, the conversation on colorism, because that's the type of um, discrimination I experience more than anything else is colorism. And I had an instance in my own neighborhood what? where I was accused of stealing. It's happened to me everywhere I go. Whether it's the beauty supply store, I've been held up so that they can check the camera to make sure that what I have in my bag that I purchased from another store is not from their store. Then the supermarket, which is already six blocks away from my house, um, stops me every time I go in to check my personal handbag to make sure I don't have anything in my personal handbag. I've called corporate, I've, I've, stopped, I, I've tried to stop going to the store, but the reality of it is, if I don't go to that one that's already six blocks away from me, I gotta travel with two kids to one that's 20 blocks away from me. So it is a problem that uh, many of us are experiencing all the time. And can you imagine being accused of stealing? I thought I didn't work an eight hour shift, picked up kids. I gotta go, I got my kids with me. I have to go home and cook. And now I have to wait at the door so that you can search the camera to make sure I'm not stealing just because I'm black. And so, you know, it is, and I don't have an answer for this either. All I can say is that, um, we just need to be mindful. And again, this is not happening to me from black, from white people. This is happening to me from other, um, not necessarily black Americans, but um, other black people, other, let me just keep it real. It's happening from Hispanics and it's happening from Africans, not necessarily American born black people, but it's happening from people of color. Exactly, thank you, Karina. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to say um, exactly the groups that it's happening from because I just want to I, I want us growing up from in a Caribbean house, you know I grew up hearing you're not American and there was always this separation of blackness and I think that and again Allison you said that we're gonna discuss that at a further um, uh, uh, session of this but I just want to just really just express how much it is bothersome to experience this type of discrimination every day, like all the time, all the time, okay? And like what, you know, just what I'm going through and even you can hear it, it's like I'm listening um, to Derek talk and it got a rise in me because th that is my life all the time. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. That was a powerful share. Thank you, Karen. That That's crazy. Um, I'm going to unmute you, Floor. Thank you, Alison. Um, so, yes, to Derek's point, um, I just wanted to say, yes, you're not alone in that. I definitely thought about it. I am a do it yourself type of person. Like, I could probably try to rebuild my whole house, which means a lot of materials from stores like Home Depot. And um, when I heard about things that, you know, they are or they are not doing, I thought about the same issue that you, you know, share with us. And I have it is five minutes away driving. So 
is the one place that is closest to me that can offer the things and materials that I need. So I just thought, and this will probably sound a little bit like a coach talking, planning, 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 basically planning ahead because that way I can maybe order online and do things like that because it's the very little that I can do, right? To, to, to help the cause. It's basically thinking about, do I really need this now? Is there another place? And it's educating myself about what else is out there because of course there are things that I automatically think about Home Depot when I could potentially get it from even the 99 cent store that might not be owned specifically by a person of color, but if it's within the community and you're helping that community increase, you know, the revenues, you can potentially be helping schools in that area and things like that. So it's making those little connections sometimes. Um, and also thinking is, you know, like, like for me to think, I, I thought about Lowe's, like, where do I find one? But maybe it's not Lowe's. Maybe there is another hard, hardware store that is not maybe as far as Lowe's, but, you know, basically doing your research and sometimes doing your planning to maybe put in for later things that you can order online for a brand that will support what you are supporting as well. And also just sometimes taking that extra step when possible, because it won't always be possible. But if at a time you do have to get from Home Depot, just knowing that you are making a conscious effort you know, that matters a lot when, whenever possible. And that's what I wanted to share. I recently put off a project because it's just like a thing that I want to do. But the materials I was going to get from Home Depot, and I decided, well, I guess I can do it later when I can get it from a store that I do want to support. Or before going to Home Depot, let me stop at the 99 cent store, like I said, or the hardware store that is in my neighborhood or the closest neighborhood if I can, and, and that's the way that I guess I can try to contribute. And also by telling others about it, so you educate everybody else up around you and helping them make those connections, helping them think like, well, you know, let's help the community as well, because that will have an impact on better schools in your community and, and all those other things that can help, you know, in, in I, I guess have an effect in a, not so direct way. No, I agree. Hold on, sorry guys, trying to mute, unmute. Um, Sophia, I'm going to unmute you. Chris, I saw your hand raised. Um, it is 2.45, so we're still recording till three. Um, so we'll gather these comments and then transition to our last topic. Thank you everyone for sharing. Yeah, we have power in numbers, so I'm very excited to hear everyone. Okay. You. Oh, you did unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, and that's actually um, one of the things that I wanted to like kind of reinforce in thinking about um, the brands that we support, um, but also the, the bigger and the smaller piece, right? Uh, I have a friend that only buys Made in America, and she tries to buy only local, um, locally made things, or she recently spent $150 on peaches from Georgia, but um, the quality was amazing, the taste was amazing, and, and everything was organic and all that good stuff. She has the ability to do that, so good for her. Um, so one of the things that I, um, I had a dilemma with, because um, I'm similar to you, Sid, is Wendy's. Uh, we do a lot of Wendy's. We absolutely do not like McDonald's in our house. Um, and with two kids, you know, cooking every day is not um, an option. So Wendy's is just a mile and a half away. Quick drive through, whatever we keep moving. When, aside from George Floyd, there was also a Wendy's franchisee owner. Um, I think he owned something like 15 Wendy's uh, operations. Donated, I think it was three hundred thousand dollars to the Trump uh, re-election campaign. It was really frustrating, you know. Um, and I think many of us have seen a lot of people donate big money or or give opportunities to um, causes that we're not with. And I realized here in South Jamaica, Queens, um, 
that franchisee owner is probably not um, someone that would be giving to Trump. I don't know, maybe not, but it wasn't that guy. So um, in having to make a tough decision, um, we decided to continue to patronize Wendy's because at the end of the day, if we want to put our money where our mouth is, um, literally we do, um, you know, it wasn't going to make any impact by taking away from a local business owner here that may be a POC and, and stand for a lot of the things that we stand for. So, um, you know, that wasn't a choice that we decided to make um, to opt out. I think I'm just really focused on the credit, no credit. Opting out of Wendy's. Um, they're still okay in our books right now, at least locally. But if we go anywhere, I don't know if we would necessarily um, patronize. So. Um, thank you. What we do have next is Chris. Um, I wanted to say too, um, to think about why it's inconvenient to support other businesses and not corporations. And historically, the civil rights movement and other movements, it was never convenient to do stuff, um, right? So part of the reason why they talk about the black buying power and this arbitrary number of what we can do. The number that, that the money doesn't circulate into our community before it goes somewhere else. And partially because we don't own anything, right? Or we don't own as many of the things, right? So I would just challenge people to not be so hard on yourself around not going to a particular company, but more about well then maybe you if you have a, a apartment or a house you just got and you gotta go to Home Depot, maybe you pay somebody who's black to to contract it, right? Or maybe you donate to, oh, so I'm gonna say like, like people get attached to what they think they can do and they get very limited and stop. And it's like, yes, uh, not supporting our brand can help, but it needs to be just more than you to make an impact. So unless you are uh, organizing with your group of people or your community to do that, then uh, the pressure on yourself to not buy the piece of tape that you need is not gonna actually make any difference anyway, right? So I'm just saying that, yes, learn about black owned businesses, people of color businesses, local hardware stores they have in the, in the city, but also understand why it's so inconvenient to eat them. There's a reason why fruit costs more at a supermarket than it does to go to McDonald's. There's a reason why. And these, uh, these things are also about, again, slavery and, and um, oppression and uh, white supremacy. So like, there's a reason why, and if you understand why, you may be a little more patient with yourself around finding other alternatives, because it's not necessarily that. The comment earlier around, um, uh, not the, because we call it, I went with the Schomburg Center for uh, Black Culture, it was a, a black library in Harlem. We talk about diasporic blackness in a, uh, in a bigger sense because blackness is not a monolith. Um, so there are black people who, who are from Mexico, black people from um, Colombia, black people who are Dominican, black people who are all over the world, but their experience of being black is very different. So, of course, people, a lot of, a lot of people, black people, Korean people, Filipinos, if you can, if you're a first generation, a lot of the, uh, people's stories are very romantic how they came to the country. I either ran from oppression or my family came to the U.S. to start a new life. It's very romantic. Uh, the people who have been here since 1619 came in chains. So a lot of the systematic culture that people are talking about is wrapped up in a different narrative. So, of course, um, on top of colorism, on top of just um, not feeling a part of Americanness, a lot of the diasporic people who are not American talk badly about the American Blacks. So here's why it may create a, a feeling or resistance to uh, hoarding what it means to be American or not, right? And it's important for us to understand how it got here and less about why I'm mad, right? Because I grew up in a Black culture. I'm, I'm from born and raised in Harlem. Of course, my, my neighbor across the country was always Dominican. They always been very close to me and my family, always. My best friend's Dominican, so I grew up understanding the entire thing. But also, I'm unique, right? A lot of people are not from those kind of neighborhoods. So, um, I when I see certain stuff that comes up, when people who are maybe diasporic or African who say some um, something around blackness or black Americans about us being stupid or not only anything, and there's a girl who was um, from Bangladesh who made a comment around, um, I don't understand why people in, in the uh, hip hop over glorify drugs and over glorify this, and I was like. Harlem was on fire in the 80s. Like, I don't think you understand what that actually means. And uh, which is going back, going back to the micro, micro part. If you don't require your institution of CUNY to do more in which are being taught in every subject, every class, that's part of the problem. That people come to the country 
come to understanding and not understanding the full scope of why these things exist, right? More than pointing a finger. And it's a reason why it's hard to get what you need locally in your community. It's a reason. Chris, can I interject and ask either you or Graciano to talk about um, Schomburg as an individual um, and what he means to, you know, education about blackness? So Arturo Schomburg was a Puerto Rican who identified as black and he was a bibliophile, which means he loved books. So in 1925, he had amassed 5,000 artifacts, meaning books, art, sculptures, around black, the black experience, right? Across the diaspora, not just what it means to be American, right? He was born and raised in Puerto Rico, moved to the US. He knew everybody, the, the uh, Linson Hughes and the boy, he knew everybody. And in that, he got books. And started uh, getting that. And this white, a white uh, librarian for NYPL named Ernestine Rose got Carnegie Foundation to uh, pay for his collection of materials. And then it became part of the um, NYPL. And it, that became the birth of the Schomburg Center, which is the uh, largest repository, the largest black archive library in the country that supports and teaches and preserves uh, the black experience more than just American black, right? So we talk about slavery, we talk about civil rights, but also if you if if you identify in black and produce some material be it in the country or out we archive that um so i have because i grew up in harlem and grew up with a grandmother who uh, made me very radicalized as a kid i went to a black college i'm part of a black church i'm an ame like all these things have supported me to understand how i am uh unique but also not the standard right like there's so much other things and how i build community and build family and the Schomburg has literally history of all of it. We have books written in Spanish. We, have, we call it books written in all the uh, language of the oppressor. We have all of it. So the German books in Germany, we have the, uh, books on when people were trying to um, figure out how big Africa was. These white people got together and did and made this um, a book. We have all those books, right? So um, the Schomburg can be a resource to learn more about um, what you probably didn't learn at home or didn't learn at, at CUNY and to help add to what you already think you do know, right? Is that clear about what Schomburg is? Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, let we actually did a project too on Afro Latinos, actually, at Schomburg uh, a couple years ago. We were we were thinking about that too. Um, so I just want to. I'm mute. We can't hear you. Oh no. So I'm I'm unmuting uh, Karina first. And I was then... just gonna say, uh, Christopher, you 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 nailed it on the head. A lot of people forget about Afro Latinos. Not everyone identifies as Hispanic, right? When you start to understand the word Hispanic and Latinx, you'll be able to understand that we're much more multifaceted. And so I'm glad that Sophia even brought up Schomburg because people don't even know that he's Black and Latinx. So that, that's, that's excellent. And that's a good segue for, for Black Pride. I know uh, me as a Latinx, and I might be brown, but on the lighter skin spectrum, um, I'm definitely proud of people like like Schomburg coming out and doing what he did because that shows that there's more than just um I feel like we only talk about certain black culture but black culture is universal it is very universal and it's a, it's a longer conversation that we can have today but uh, I'm glad you guys brought that up and also Schomburg's calling himself black was also about politics right um today we are more attached to being Nigerian American Caribbean American, this, that. Uh, and there was a, a point in American history where the people who looked like each other, more than how they identified, had to get together and do a thing. So even though there were people in the early 20th century, like 1900s, 1800s, who might have been here from Panama or from the Caribbean or from Mexico or whatever, um, and who identified as Latin, they understood how important it was for them to know where their politics lies. So it was like, I don't look like this for nothing. So I have to say I'm black. So when people see me show up and when I evolve and be excellent and do a thing, that people know that I am proud of a thing. So I, I appreciate how much the world has changed and grown to understand how nuanced the experience are in Latin America. And um, again, growing up with Dominicans, I've had a great love for how nuanced their experience is. But also saying I am black is also about uh, being revolutionary around like what that looks like, right? Like it's like, no, 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 like I'm part of this thing, even though it may look different. And people want to spend a lot of time on how this how this nuance, and which is important, but the I am is part of the reason why we talk about Black Lives Matter, right? 
everybody who is black in the country, all 41 million of those people don't identify as black for whatever reason that is. And Sean Bird did it before it was popular. I, I just want to give, because uh, I know we're running short on time, so I just want to say a little bit about, um, about Arturo Schomburg and his life because as Chris was um, saying, it's really important that we learn our history and we learn about um, all of these, these things that don't get taught in school. So, you know, he described himself as an afro borinqueño That's the term that he used at the time. He was born in Santuce, Puerto Rico. At the age of 17, he came to New York and he was a founding member of an organization called Secretary of he was the uh, founding member and secretary of an organization called Las Dos Antillas in New York. And basically, it was an organization that fought for the liberation of Puerto Rico and Cuba. This is in, before the Hispanic-American War, the Spanish-American War. Um, so that organization actually was where um, the actual Puerto Rican flag was created here in New York. Um, by, by that organization. He was friends and associates with other, um, you know, freedom fighters like Jose Mati, Maximo Gomez, and Antonio Maceo. And a political mentor um, was Ramon Betances. And for those who don't know, these are people who fought for the liberation of um, a lot of the Caribbean countries, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Schomburg, um, did not believe in colonialism either under the United States or um, Spain. And as a young man, one of the things that motivated him is a teacher, when he was in school, a teacher told him that black people have no history, no heroes, and no great moments. And from that time, he refused to accept that. And he set on a lifelong mission to uncover Africa's hidden history. Schomburg, while living in New York, researched slave narrative, manuscripts, rare, rare books, journals, paints, playbills, uh, paintings, artwork, and other remnants of African history, including throughout the entire diaspora. You know, um, like Chris was saying, they, they saw themselves in a different light at that time. They're like, oh, you, you look like me. We're going to all fight together. At the time, um, he also documented the accomplishments of other Afro-Latinos, such as Puerto Rican um, artist Jose Campache, the Haitian liberator Toussaint, I, I'm going to mess up that name. Help me. Love it, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and the uh, Afro uh, Cuban general Antonio uh, Maceo. Um, and other. It, it goes on and on. It's really long. But, you know, his idea was, um, and a lot of the, the people in the Caribbean and the, what we now call African Americans, that term didn't exist in. At, at the time, it was um, you differently. They they supported each other's struggles. They traveled to each other's islands. They um, supported each other's um, liberation and trying to document all of those histories. I think that you know now, 110 years later, I think that we could go back and we could learn from from those experiences. Kind of like redefine what these different nationalities and these different terms mean. So, I don't know. I think we're all out of time yeah, now. Right? Yeah, we're good for time. <laughs> I want to in there. <laughs> all right. No, thank you everyone for contributing today. We It is three o'clock. So, I know some people may need to go. And so, I'm going to stop recording. Um, thank you all for coming. Next week, though, please remember two o'clock, tune back in. We're going to talk about independence for who and Frederick Douglass. We're going to examine um, his speech about July 4th, so please join us in that. Again, um, share the link to anyone who you think would like to be in on these sessions. Um, if you want to contribute to any of our sessions, please let me know. Um, Karina Guardiola Lopez, you can let her know, or anyone else in the coaching unit so that we have more to contribute to these conversations. Thank you everyone for sharing today. So insightful. Um, really is a great space, but I'm going to stop recording us and if we can continue the conversation, just have to end the hour.